Hello everyone. Good morning. Uh, today we are presenting about the wake of communal fascism in India. And this is, I think, the fifth or sixth uh, panel in a year, uh, I mean, in consecutive years of Samhati. Uh, we are, it's a mostly web based group. It's an activist group uh, that uh, talks about the new liberal policies in India and about different resistance struggles. <coughs> and um, as you might know, this year has been a watershed year in India. I mean, not a good kind of watershed, but uh, it's a very eventful year when uh, Narendra Modi of the Hindu Nationalist uh, Party, which is like a right wing party, has, has now come to power. And uh, Narendra Modi has a uh, so what interesting past, he was the chief minister of Gujarat when uh, the Gujarat, um, there were anti-Muslim riots and 2,000 people uh, got killed and uh, many feel that he was responsible. But it is part of a long trend that has started a long time, uh, uh, quite, a, quite some time ago. And we are just seeing the final, like, not the final chapter, who knows what's going to happen next. But um, one of the ethics of that. So we will be talking about uh, how this um, fascism has come to rise in India and what exactly these electoral numbers mean. And we'll do a specific case study of a riot in Muzaffar Nagar uh, that uh, happened last year. Uh, this is a very recent riot and it shows like how politics and economics and uh, you know, fascism, they are, they are all kind of uh, used to uh, get this right wing party into power. So, I should have introduced myself first. Uh, I'm Siddhartha, um, Siddhartha Mitra, and I'm a computer programmer based in New York City. Uh, but I have been interested in the issues of tribal um, people in India, the indigenous people in India, the dispossession that they have been facing, and I've traveled in the areas in Central India. So um, that's also uh, has a, a BJP, which is the Bharatiya Janata Party, which is this Hindu nationalist party in power. and. Uh, they have uh, uh, an example of uh, how they have been using uh, disposition to gain the people lands. So uh, I will talk about the origins of fascism in India, in the fascism in India. Then we have Abhishek Konar. He's a graduate student in Ohio State University. And he's also in the International Socialist Organization. And uh, he's screened the, uh, the Final Solution, which is a film on rise of the fascism in India. Uh, he's, he screened that in uh, Ohio. And uh, so he will be talking about the exact numbers of uh, electoral, um, what, what these percentages mean. Like, BJP apparently had a big sweep, but how did that sweep happen? Where were the swings? And what changed over last year? And uh, Samantha Rubal, like, uh, she has been, um, she's also a student of Ohio State, and she studied political science. And uh, she, for the last year, she has gone and worked with uh, Sudha Bhattwaj, who is a human rights uh, activist and a lawyer in Chhattisgarh in India, which is quite this part of central India where um, a lot of this uh, resistance to disposition and disposition is going on in indigenous so, land. Uh, so she will be talking about a specific case study of uh, Muzaffar Nagar, which is the, uh, the, what I told you, like there was this riots last year. So, um, I think I will start about, uh, I'll give a brief introduction and then uh, Abhishek and then uh, Sam will speak. So my topic is about, I don't have a presentation so I'll just talk. So the rise of Hindu fascism in India and how this fascism, how it is different from the European kind of fascism. So um, Hinduism itself as a religion as a kind of a scriptural religion never really existed uh, till the British came. Before uh, Islam had come to India around uh, 1008, and uh, when, the, when Islam had come, after a few centuries, there was um, sort of uh, a mix between the Islamic faiths and the Hindu faiths. And there was a lot of uh, influences from Islam that came into Hinduism. For example, the Sufi movement, they inspired the Bhakti movement in, uh, in Hinduism. And Bhakti movement was a devotional uh, movement. Uh, it was led by people like Sri Chaitanya and the Hare Krishna. Uh, that, that group comes from that lineage. That anybody from any caste, they can uh, reach um, God without having uh, the kind of structural settings that Hinduism had. 
uh, of having castes and having Brahmins as priests and uh, you know different temples where only people of certain caste could, could go. So, uh, and Sikh, Sikhism, which is um, the Sikhs in uh, Punjab, that is also a movement that came out of this influence. And similarly, the Muslims, they adopted a lot of Hindu practices. Like, there were practices like, uh, um, I, yeah. there were practices like uh, the burning of widows called Sakhi, and even Muslims adopted that. So this went on for a few centuries, and Babur, who was uh, a descendant of, um, a relative descendant of Chinggis Khan, uh, and uh, Kubla Khan, uh, he was a Mongol, but he came to India and established uh, what's called the Persian dynasty, and, and this is the lineage where Shah Jahan builds the Taj Mahal. So Babur, when he comes to India in 1500, he says that uh, Hinduism and Muslim uh, Islam is so mixed that I do not recognize Islam as a religion anymore. Then, um, the, um, uh, we have some Islamic rulers, and they did refer to Hindus as Hindus. But Hinduism itself was so multicultural. There were, uh, my, I mean, multifaceted. There were many different sects, and uh, there were the Charvakas who were atheists. Then there were the Shaivites, and there were the Vaishnavites. And uh, it, it wasn't like defined according to a religion, like a scriptural religion. It was a lived practice. And then the uh, British come, and then the British come in the 1700s and the 1800s. What they want to do is that they want to establish a legal system over which they could rule India, and also through their conservative Protestant lens, they wanted to find the false god. Uh, in, like in Africa, they say, oh, this is your false god, therefore believe in ours. But uh, they weren't able to find one because Hinduism you know, is all over the place, and Islam also was all over the place. If they, there wasn't one religion they could focus, again, uh, 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 focus on, or, uh, or a sect they could focus on. So at this time, um, there was a person called Raja Ramon Roy, who was a liberal, and he had been educated in uh, England. And uh, he was the son of a wealthy Indian family. And uh, he uh, spoke with the Islamic and the Christian scholars. And then um, he also wanted to, uh, he wanted to put Hinduism in a Vedic mode. Like, uh, there were, in the Indian, uh, there were the scriptures. Some of the scriptures were, written down after a point, and some were just, uh, um, what's called, like, it's passed on by word of mouth. And one of the scriptures was the Vedas, which was sort of the text for the Brahmins, which were the people of the upper caste. And they were the, also the scriptures with the Puranas, which were like people of the, you know, ordinary people. And, and um, the Vedas and Puranas, some stories were literally in conflict with each other on how life should be led. But uh, Ramun Roy, who was a uh, Brahmin himself, and he wanted to, have this Vedic, like kind of Brahminical high caste system of living um, put as a framework of Hinduism. And he also wanted to stop uh, practices like widow burning and, uh, you know, sati and, and throwing children, uh, you know, child sacrifices, throwing old women, old people into the Ganges. So, uh, and the British were looking for a legal system. So he said that uh, Hinduism is as defined in the Vedas. And in the Vedas, there are like sentences which says, you know, the woman lay down next to her dead husband, but did she get up again? I mean, this is not very clear, like, you know, what is that meant? So you could interpret it in both ways. You say, oh, that does mean that there's, you know, study, there's a burning of videos, or it means it, it's not. So Ramon Roy used that to say, uh, to say that there was no, um, uh, in, the, in, the, in the scriptures, it is uh, not mentioned, therefore we use it as a legal framework, and at the same time, there's a conservative movement that said, oh, this is, uh, this is uh, this, we will use the scriptures and it is a legal framework that uh, um, uh, Hinduism is of, uh, is saying that there should be videos should be burned. But in any case, the British adopted Ramun Roy's uh, uh, approach. But what this led to um, uh, the fact that Hinduism became like a scriptural religion. Now we could define a Hinduism. And when it becomes a scriptural religion, it comes into conflict with Islam and Christianity, which are also scriptural religions. So, um, and at the same time, there were other practices, like uh, other movements, like Arya Samaj of uh, Swami Dayanand Saraswati, which uh, Swami Abhivesh uh, is a latest promoter, he's the latest leader of it, and he's a supporter of the BJP. Uh, he also uh, established a very similar uh, organization like Ramon Roy's. Then there was the Brahmo Samaj, uh, which was the a liberal, like non-denominational uh, group, but uh, Rabindranath Tagore, who was uh, great thinker and Nobel Prize winner in literature. 
the river of that language, the Brahmo language. In this context, what happens, so, so there are two movements now. One is like a you know, liberal movement, and then there's a conservative movement. And both are saying that Hinduism is according to the Vedas. In fact, both are against the Puranas. They have this Purana burning uh, ceremonies where they burn Puran, copies of Puranas. So that, that's not how life should be left, uh, led. Now, in this context, like Indian nationalism starts uh, to take place. And in 1880, the, the Congress is formed. And in 1914, an organization is formed. It's called the Hindu Mahasabha. So, uh, and this was formed by uh, Lal Bahadur Shastri and Mother Mohan Malviya. And the purpose of this organization is to create a Hindu nation. So here uh, we can recall what Narendra Modi, who has become our prime minister now, said two years ago that I'm a Hindu nationalist. And in reality, they are one and the same thing. Hinduism was practically defined on, on, the, on the basis of being a nation. And, and, the, and the idea of a nation would have to be a Hindu nation. And a Hindu nation that is based on Vedic scriptures. At this time, uh, there's someone called Savarkar, he takes central stage. And he is, um, again, an educated uh, from, a, uh, from a wealthy family. And he's, uh, he goes to London. Uh, in the um, early part of the uh, 20th century, I mean late 1890, beginning 1900. And despite his later views, uh, uh, he, 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 what he does is that um, he writes about the Sepoy mutiny, which was the first revolution against the British rule in India in 1857. And he said that the Hindus and Muslims had a common jihad. Uh, and he uses the word jihad, and he talks about like a Hindu Muslim unity of sorts. But then uh, he, is, uh, he goes to London and then he gets involved in the nationalistic group and militant group and he's accused, I mean, he is indicted on a charge of a conspiracy of trying to kill a British national and he's sent to the Andaman Islands, which is this prison uh, for life. And there he gets into conflict with certain Muslim Pathans who are controlling some sort of oil well, but there's sort of a power, stru power struggle that, that occurs there. But when he comes out, he has, uh, he comes out, he tells the British that I'll never be a threat to you. And he's given a pension, and he comes out, and, but when he's released in 1920, uh, around that time, he says that our enemy is Muslims, and these uh, are the outsider uh, outsiders. And then uh, with uh, how fascism was coming up in Europe, they model um, this, uh, the Hindu ideology based on that fascism. Uh, uh, fascist notions that uh, how Hitler and Mussolini um, uh, developed it, and, and in fact, like they are still their uh, heroes in, in the Gujarat textbook. They are still they have a very positive. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, how they are presented in a very very positive manner, and these are the same people who essentially assassinate Gandhi. So, 1914, that is formed. Savarkar he becomes a president in 1937, and he emphasizes that uh, any religion that comes up within India, like um, uh, Hinduism, uh, Buddhism, Jainism, they originate in, in India. So these are the, like, they are part of the Indian Hinduism. So he assimilates those into Hinduism, but at the same time he says that um, uh, Islam and Christianity, they are not. So, uh, and in 1925, what's, uh, there's an organization called the Rashtriya Swayamsevak Sangh that is formed, and this actually got banned three times because it was openly fascist. The difference between Indian fascism and the uh, Western fascism was um, Indian fascism never really like had access to power, but they wanted to get into power. They knew that India was going to become independent uh, at some point, but they didn't want a power in which Muslims would have any say, like in Punjab or in Bengal, where partition happened in this Muslim majority areas. So um, what they wanted to make sure is that if independence happens, which they never supported this independence movement, that it would have to have an authoritarian succession. It would have to be a military rule in which Muslims would be subjugated by force. So during the partition, a lot of this um, killings, I mean, there were killings that really mass killings. There was a place called Berar, where like 82,000 Muslims were killed. Um, they were um, organized by this Rashtra Swam I mean, they had a network all around, and uh, they wanted to uh, stop this uh, partition and they wanted to make sure like when independence happened, it would be only uh, kind of Hindu militant uh, uh, independent kind of independence. But um, independence does take place 1947, but uh, so we have like a kind of a secular state 
but within which there's these fascist uh, uh, tendencies. I mean, at that time, there were a lot of Hindu arms training schools. Like, there were many schools, like, where they were said, like, to become, you know, the true Indian, you have to be this uh, Hindu arms uh, in the military. And in fact, there has been a huge resurgence in the last few years. These training schools, these arms training schools for kids, always existed um, in India, and there are actually some, I mean, RSS camps in the US too, uh, and internationally. But uh, they, uh, in the, when, uh, when it was kind of becoming clear that uh, Narendra Modi could come to power two years ago, uh, in the last years, 4,800 new, new schools have come up. Sorry, new sakas have come up uh, of the RSS. So, um, so India becomes independent, and uh, there, are, there is this uh, tendency, uh, and secularism could survive by saying that, look, if we fail, what comes is this fascism, and then there are the uh, uh, mass and killings. But secularism, people like Congress, um, and the was, which is part of, uh, which ruled in India for so many, almost 50, 60 years, and now they've got completely demolished in the last elections, uh, but they're part of this uh, UPA, um, uh, United uh, Progressive Alliance. They, they were um, uh, essentially, uh, they were doing the same thing. They would play the caste card and the religion card, and Gandhi did the same thing. You know, Gandhi, when he's adopting uh, people of lower caste and he's uh, bringing them into the fold, he's calling them Harijan. And that, I mean, the only way into Hinduism, uh, and this is another uh, technique that's used by the Hindu fundamentalists, is you know, uh, they want the lower caste in because that increases the numbers. I mean, yes, 75 percent people are lower caste, so you cannot have a Hindu nationalist movement. Otherwise, uh, this is like they never really had a mass base because you know their object was you know elimination of the Muslims. But they pretended that they would accommodate people of the lower caste, but they kind of had to start from the bottom. You know, or indigenous people they have this ceremony called the Khar Bapsi, like come back home. So. Um, and, and uh, I'll just finish quickly and uh, in the sense that what I what I try to show is that how uh, this this started, you know, how Hinduism gets defined, how Islam gets defined, and then nationalism becomes important. And what became later part of it during independence is the collision with capital. So G. T. Pirda, who was a big industrialist, he was very sympathetic to uh, the Hindu fundamentalists, and he also worked with uh, Gandhi. I mean, uh, you know, funded uh, Gandhi a lot. So he didn't listen to all of Gandhi's requests, he did it as needed. And uh, there was a chief minister, Pallabhai Patel, who uh, essentially let uh, these programs take place and what, hap what has happened since that uh, in the programs of the uh, 1947 and then uh, there was the, the last two milestones were in 1991 uh, in Babi Masjid, uh, which was this disputed mosque um, um, temple site uh, in Ayodhya. Uh, that, that had been locked down for 50 years because there was a dispute. This Muslim said that this is an original uh, mosque, and, and Hindu said that this is a temple, and that was demolished by Hindu fundamentalists. And, and the government literally stood by watching, you know. They should have cordoned off the area, they never did that. And that led to riots in Bombay. Many people got killed, and Bombay had a, 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 a political party called Shiv Sena, which has been uh, ruling essentially since then. And, and they are, uh, they play this exclusionary, explicit. Exclusionary card. So, uh, but recently with Narendra Modi and what has happened in the tribal regions of India, uh, it is this uh, new liberal policies and this uh, uh, the economic gain of private capital, which, is, which has become um, something of, of focus. And how this has is is being used by the right wing party is that. Uh, which they have come to power, they have generated a lot of anger against the minorities. In 2002, you know, uh, Modi organizes, literally organizes this huge program in Gujarat. So the idea is, this new liberal policy is going to lead to a lot of uh, dispossession, and that dispossession is going to create a lot of anger, um, and that anger is going to be deflected onto the minorities. So that's like a brief, uh, short summary. Uh, I don't know if you want to. So, uh, continue on the, if you want to explain the election results. Sure. Um, so, my name is Abhishek, um, and uh, I'm a graduate student, as Shittatuda uh, mentioned, I'm a graduate student at Ohio State University. Um, so, I'm going to be uh, talking about the, uh, the uh, these are some initial thoughts that we are, uh, we have now, and uh, uh, much remains to be seen uh, how these things play out. 
Um, so the one the thing, one feature has been. So what I will do is I will uh, talk about the uh, the uh, narrative of that, the fact that BJP has had a sweeping victory, and uh, why, what does it mean, and then discuss some of the characteristics um, of this uh, of this of the of the electoral results, and then you know uh, provide uh, a few uh, reasons uh, of why and how that uh, came about. So basically, uh, what does it mean when we say that BJP has had a uh, sweeping victory? So in the, uh, historically, uh, so what happens is if you, if, if a single party gets 272 seats, you have a, a majority, then this one single party can form the government. Now the last time that happened was in 1984. Uh, this was in 1984 and this happened this was a sympathy vote which Congress got after the death of Indira Gandhi. And Rajiv Gandhi, who, who was the son of Indira Gandhi, got a lot of sympathy vote because his mother had died and he was voted as a prime minister. This, this happened in 1984. After that, no party, uh, be it Congress or any other party, uh, could actually get uh, a, sing a single majority. There's uh, always, all the governments have been uh, coalition governments made of uh, different uh, one of the uh, 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 major Indian parties and then regional uh, parties. So this is the first time. Uh, no one was expecting uh, BJP. I mean, there was there was a narrative that you know there is a Modi wave. Uh, there's going to be Sunamo, uh, Namo being Narendra Modi. Um, so there was you know the corporate media was playing this um, uh, uh, for a long time. But even the most fervent BJP supporters did not believe that uh, they would have a single majority. They thought that NDA, the coalition of BJP, would have the majority that they would go past uh, 272 seats. Um, so what happened was BJP alone got 282 seats, and NDA got 331. So that is what means, you know, this is what the sweeping victory means. So uh, now this raises some questions, which is that, does that mean that the electorate, you know, the you know the population in India has shifted to the right. Does that mean that this is the uh, the, uh, the you know people have now voted uh, in power this you know divisive force, uh, you know this you know uh, the party which stands for majoritarian violence in many ways actually. Um, so one feature that I would like to mention is that uh, BJP uh, this in this the 2014 Lok Sabha election polls uh, got 31 percent of the vote. That means 31% of the population who voted actually voted for BJP. And the NDA coalition got 382 So this is actually the lowest voting percentage for any party who has won and come to power. Um, which sort of, you know, um, you know, this, we should pause and rethink whether this means this is a, this is a uh, uh, whether this is a mandate for you know, uh, a, a virulent fascism which BJP stands for. Um, so yeah, so there is that. Um, and this raises some questions about the electoral policy of the first, uh, first past the post, um, you know. Um, so the, the next thing that I, would, that I would like to mention is that, uh, that there is a tension. Uh, uh, there is a tension in uh, BJP and Narendra Modi uh, between uh, uh, two things, one is uh, the neoliberal policies that uh, BJP, uh, you know, seems to be championing, uh, because there is a lot of corporate money which has flown in um, uh, before the elections uh, for BJP, and you know, the corporate media completely uh, uh, was complicit in, uh, the, uh, you know, playing this that there is a movie wave. Then there is the the other part, which is the part of the the Hindu fascist. Uh, uh, the Hindu fascist identity politics uh, of BJP. So there is a tension, and it remains to be seen uh, how this is going to play out eventually. Um, and I'm going to uh, comment uh, on that. So one thing to remember is that you know, in the last presidential election in the United States, the amount of money which Barack Obama raised was one billion dollars. One billion dollars, and the amount of money which BJP uh, spent uh, uh, rupees 5,000 crores, which is slightly less than $1 billion, was spent only on advertisement. 
slightly less than a billion dollars was spent by BJP only on advertisement. And then there is other. Which means who are these people, you know, uh, giving this money? So there, if you read the newspapers, people are elated. And that would include, you know, some of my family members. Uh, they, are, they are actually very happy and elated uh, that, uh, you know, the Sensex, which is, you know, the, the stock market is going to be, you know, doing really well, which is true. Uh, I actually truly believe that might be true. Because these are the people who funded the election. They did not give 5,000 crore rupees in advertisement for nothing. So this probably is going to happen. So this is one uh, uh, feature. Um, uh, you know, some people have uh, said that this is the biggest uh, corporate heist uh, in, in election in, in, in India, uh, which probably is uh, true. Uh, this has been going on for a while, actually. Um, they have been preparing for uh, many years. So for example, uh, Narendra Modi, uh, who is you know, infamous for many things, um, uh, uh, primarily because of the, the state-sponsored pogrom, which uh, Shiddhadara mentioned in his introductory comments, uh, the state-sponsored pogrom, which, was, uh, which happened in Gujarat 2002, um, you know, uh, so he hired this Western firm called um, APCO, uh, APCO uh, to, uh, you know, whitewash his crimes and, you know, uh, uh, to have a very, this is a PR uh, thing that's been going on for a long time. Uh, you know, Gujarat government has funded uh, uh, these activities. Um, and the corporate media was completely, you know, was uh, complicit in this, you know, uh, in this, uh, creating this narrative, which is, not unheard of, like, this is not very surprising. This is something that they have done before. Uh, India shining, this was, uh, you know, uh, early 2000s elections. Um, so again, this is the same corporate media, you know, who would always swing for the party which is, uh, which is representing the neoliberal policies. So, you know, sections of the neoliberal, uh, section of this corporate media, suddenly, you know, started championing Buddha Bhatt Charge. Uh, who was the chief minister uh, of West Bengal, he was uh, uh, of the Communist Party of India Marxist, CPM. Uh, suddenly the corporate media swung and was, you know, uh, very happy to promote Buddha Bhatt Charge because, you know, he was bringing in investment. You know, he was, this, when the, the left, the so-called left, took neoliberal, um, uh, you know, undertook neoliberal policies. Um, so this is one part of the story. So the other part is the, uh, the uh, so, you know, in the campaign, they selectively used, uh, you know, uh, so for example, the major, the main platform which Narendra Modi ran on was the platform of development. He was called the Vikas Purush, meaning the development man. Um, so this was one platform, the Vikas Purush, which is, which is what I was talking about. But the other was, you know, trying to appeal to the communal uh, violence and, you know, riots, which is, which is what the introduction was about. Um, so, for example, he would go to different places, and um, uh, so this is, you know, he has been uh, a member of the Rashtriya Swayam Sevak Sangh RSS uh, from the age of eight. He was a Pracharak uh, from the age of eight, um, and, um, you know, he was also the, you know, when El Khadwani, you know, did his uh, Rath Yatra in the 1990s, which led to hundreds of communal riots across the country. The Rath Yatra actually started in Gujarat and was organized by uh, Narendra Modi. So the, this is his background, which a lot of the times is you know forgotten, and the uh, and the story that we are you know uh, what we are asked to believe is that he oh you are stuck in 2002. He now he's a development man. Mm -hmm. So we are stuck in 2002 and we are you know asked to for, forget uh, the past, but they are allowed to go to medieval history. And talk about you know, <laughs> you know right. demolishing mosques and building Ram Mandir in that right place. You know this is one of the slogans that we will build the Mandir exactly in the, on that spot. So this is what they will do. You know, um, so um, so so this was done selectively, meaning uh, you know to appeal to the urban middle class. He was a, a Vikas Purush, but in communal uh, areas which was you know affected by communal riots. He would go and you know foment you know uh, these communal violences. So, so for example, in Assam, where there was you know uh, in the state of Assam, there were some recent uh, unfortunate incidents of riots and killings have happened. Uh, he had again stoked the flames by uh, talking about you know uh, Bangladeshi illegal immigrants, Bangladeshi Muslims. 
So there is, a, a, you know, some there is a population of Bangladeshi Muslims who uh, you know, has migrated to Assam historically. So this is, is a you know complicated uh, problem. Uh, we should uh, definitely talk about this. But this has been cynically used. So there is a lot of Bengali Muslims living in Assam. All these Bengali Muslims are now called, you know, Bangladeshis, meaning illegal immigrants. Um, so uh, saying that this is a huge problem, you know, a demographic problem. So the uh, and he said that after I come to power, uh, the, the, these people will have to leave and go to Bangladesh. Uh, now there are some Hindus probably who uh, came in. Uh, that does not apply to them. And he specifically mentioned that uh, Hindus are welcome. Um, so this is in the context of uh, Assam. Then um, his right right um, right hand ma man is Amit Shah, who was appointed as you know one of the chief electoral. You know he was overseeing his you know uh, his electoral uh, campaign. Uh, he was, had been implicated in the, in the 2002 riots. Um, uh, he went to Uttar Pradesh um, and uh, you know talked about that this election is a revenge election. You know uh, this was this was not subtle at all. You know revenge is not very subtle when you are talking to people who have come to hear these things. You're stoking this thing. Um, um, so yes, so these are very you know uh, disturbing elements. So he has uh, said uh, the, about the party. There's a new. Uh, party called the Aam Aadmi Party, which has uh, you know come up um, arising in Delhi, and his uh, leader's name is Arvind Kejriwal. Uh, Modi has said that Arvind Kejriwal is a Pakistani agent. This is this is the kind of you know word used. This is a psychology which we pay that uh, if you are not with us, then you are you know Pakistanis or anyone who is talking about minority rights, you know about Muslims. These are all Pakistani agents probably, or you know or illegal immigrants. You need to go away. Hindus are welcome. So this is. So there is a tension, and you know uh, what I would like to, uh, you know, I think this is an open question, and we need to see how this is going to play out in the future. Uh, is that whether, you know, when uh, there is a tension of whether this Hindu right wing uh, policies, uh, you know, sometimes might hurt the interests of capital, the interests of neoliberal policies, and which one is going to have the sway? Um, so, for example, some people have mentioned that. You know the Hindu right-wing agenda will actually prevail, and capital might have to take the back seat. Uh, we don't know that might well be the case. So, for example, after 2002, uh, the Gujarat riot, um, uh, there was a, the, a Parsi, uh, you know, there was a uh, many Parsi uh, a section of the Parsi community who were, you know, businessmen, uh, wealthy businessmen. They protested and they said that this is not good. Uh, you know, we do not. Uh, you know, condone these kinds of violence against minority Muslims, and they they had some kind of protest against the Chamber of Commerce, and Modi stepped in and said, "That's fine. Uh, now we're going to have our own Chamber of Commerce." So he started um, having a new, you know, um, and then the parties, these business community had to go back. Maybe a few months later, there was a reconciliation, a handshake, and so on. So this is a fear which a lot of people have that uh, he has proved. This is Orundu Duray. Uh, noted, uh, you know, novelist. Uh, you know, she's a commentator on Indian politics. Uh, she was say, say uh, you know, she mentioned that um, Modi has proved himself. So this is not, this is not anymore. So the the the, the capitalists do not want the invisible hand. The, what they want is the iron fist. And and Modi has proved that he can, he is capable of doing. Anyone who is dissenting is now, you know, you know, Pakistani agent or Bangladeshis, and you know, and he has proved his metal. Um, that he can actually completely decimate uh, dissenters, and you know, um, so this is something which is cap which you know. Uh, uh, the other thing is that the capital is banking on that maybe this is what uh, something that Modi will do for them, which is that uh, not that the Congress government has not had neoliberal policies, but there have been some kind of hesitations uh, in you know um, uh, in certain things in carrying out you know moderate reforms. Um, have been doled out the forest rights acts and so on, and this is something that they don't want. What they want is that any kind of dissenting voice, any kind of opposition, should be completely done away with. And we need now a man who is going to do it for us, who has proved himself capable of, you know, not hesitating to kill people. Um, uh, um, so yeah, so that's so this is a tension which is between the Hindu right wing uh, fascist element and the neoliberal uh, capitalist. Um, uh, you know uh, uh, policies. Now I want to discuss some of the reasons, um, some of the reasons, and um, uh, uh, why what happened. You know why is that 
there was this unexpected victory uh, of BJP, and then my uh, thoughts as to what uh, you know we should uh, do uh, to oppose, which seems to be a very uh, frightening prospect for India. Um, so one very important reason is the anti-incumbency uh, anti factor of Congress. The Congress government has been, you know, there has been, you know, so many uh, uh, corruption scandals, which you know, the coal allegation scam, the 2G scam, the other uh, colony scam, you know, scam after scam, you know, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of crores of rupees uh, 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 corruption. Uh, this is something which you know. Uh, you know the urban middle class in particular, and everyone, um, you know, you know, uh, uh, dislike. And this is this, this is the anti-incumbency. People wanted to vote against Congress, no matter what it is. We just want to. We need an alternative to vote against Congress. So this is uh, a very important factor. Um, this led to the rise of the regional part, uh, this, the Delhi-based party that I was talking about, the Aam Aadmi Party, um, which uh, which ran. Uh, on the anti-corruption uh, uh, anti-corruption uh, platform. Before this, there was a uh, there was another movement started by Anna Hazare, again very populist and you know uh, um, uh, anti-corruption movement. Uh, the other thing is that there uh, the candidate uh, for Congress was uh, Rahul Gandhi, who was you know uh, to be polite, uh, inept, really, uh, like really you know. You're not um, not very good at electoral, uh, you know, managing electoral politics. He has a very bad public face. Um, so one of the one of the things which you know BJP did successfully was to convert this into a sort of presidential type election, which is between Narendra Modi and Rahul Gandhi. It's something which is not very common in India, which is a U.S. style politics. And so suddenly, you know, uh, Narendra Namo versus Rahul Gandhi. And then the, all the focus was on this particular interview which Rahul Gandhi gave in uh, this news channel called Times Now. And if you actually see the interview, it's really, it's really bad. It's really pathetic. And that is something which they, you know, uh, you know, they played on that, look, this is, this is what you are voting for. You know, this is the man. Not about the policies, not our, you know, you know they didn't you know, also run on the development agenda, which actually was all, you know, very, um, empty words, sort of, um, but uh, so that really played a very important role. So this is, uh, you know, reason one. The second reason is the complete absence of left. There is the left has been completely wiped out uh, in the electoral process. Um, so CPM, which was the largest uh, uh, the uh, uh, of the left uh, party, uh, and West Bengal was one of the bastions of uh, the Communist Party of India, Marxist. Uh, CPM, now they have been reduced to two seats in CPM, uh, in, in West Bengal. Um, so which is which is the worst historically. Um, this is the worst result for the parliamentary left in India. Um, so why did this happen? One thing is that um, CPM, this is the same party which, uh, when it was in power, uh, it resorted to neoliberal policies. You know, in <coughs> neoliberal policies in Shingur, in Nondi Gram, uh, you know, it uh, it invoked you know 19th century uh, uh, land acquisition bills, and then you know uh, 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 took away uh, land from farmers for so-called development, uh, and this was extremely unpopular. In Nondigram, it resorted to violence, where CPM goons actually went in motorbikes, the Hormone Bahini, uh, they went and you know wreaked violence. Uh, the police opened fire; 14 people were killed. Um, so and they were. Uh, this is this is something they have done. This is the same party which you know uh, has extremely you know contradictory policies. Uh, for, so for example, they would support nuclear plants in one place and then oppose nuclear plants in another place. Um, this is a party which you know it took them more than 50, 60 years to come up with a statement on capital punishment. Um, and after the recent execution of Abzal Guru, uh, one of the you know Politburo members, senior politician uh, of CPM, um, Sita Yachuri said that law has taken its course. This was, this was a shameful moment for the left, I would say. Um, and then after that, uh, they actually came to the conclusion, you know, I think they decided the party has now uh, come up with some resolution that we are against capital punishment. Um, uh, you know, they have, you know, they have very 
uh, problematic stance on Kashmir, on the right of self-determination of Kashmiris. Um, you know, uh, CPM members have said that um, AFSPA, AF, AFSPA, which is Armed Force Special Protection Act, which is, you know, in Northeast, uh, this is a draconian law. Uh, you know, recently one CPM member said that it's okay, but this needs to be slightly less draconian. These are really, this is something, uh, you know, lack of any programmatic, you know, working class politics, uh, you know, any kind of, um, you know, struggle-based politics, which is actually uh, led to the demise of the left. Um, and, uh, you know, any kind of criticism which, which, which has been raised from within the ranks, uh, historically, like in Prashant Bose, who left CPM, recently Shubhanil, who has uh, resigned from CPM, they raised criticisms and they have been, you know, um, uh, expelled from CPM. So this is the state of the left. And um, briefly, before I wrap up, briefly to mention that uh, the AAP, uh, why did the, this, uh, this party, Aam Aadmi Party, uh, you, know, uh, you know, has become popular and a lot of, uh, you know, left-leaning intellectuals, uh, activists have actually joined uh, this party. Why? This means, this to me is a manifestation of the complete absence of the left. So these, if there was a working class left party, these people would have joined that working class left party. In the absence of that, you know, uh, uh, working class left, the left alternative, they have no other uh, choice but uh, to join up. So this is, uh, you know, my, uh, the, the sort of way I would view up why Medha Bhatkar and Sony Sori and other folks, uh, progressive folks have joined up. So what should we do? I think uh, uh, in, in my closing statement, I would like to say that, you know, uh, really we cannot uh, hope for a CPM revival and I think the way forward, I mean, there are really disturbing trends. Whether capital wins or fascism wins, you know, we have nothing to really uh, be happy about. You know, uh, I think we have to oppose uh, either. And the way forward would be people's struggles. And people have actually shown this. You know, um, so uh, is there, there are people's movement against, uh, you know, against uh, uh, nuclear power in Tamil Nadu. There are, there are uh, mining struggles in Orissa and Jharkhand. And then there are auto workers struggle uh, in Gurgaon. All these struggles, we have to learn from these struggles. And you know, uh, I think this is the way forward, where working class people, grassroots organizing, will actually stand up um, to neoliberal policies or fascism, whoever uh, whoever seems to have uh, sway over Indian politics. And with that, you know, I, I yeah, I conclude. And, uh, Excuse me, could you talk a little louder? Yes, I will. Uh, my name is Samantha. I've been living in Chhattisgarh uh, for the past two years as in the Central Indian region. And uh, I've recently been interested in this uh, specific uh, case study of uh, Muzaffarnagar, where there was a very um, there was a very huge eruption of communal violence in 2013. Uh, basically, there was a um, elaborate planning associated with this, uh, this particular incident, which started through um, efforts by the BJP and was uh, propagated by um, all, virtually all of the uh, political parties which are better in um, the Pradesh. And uh, the main questions that we'll be addressing is um, basically why uh, in a place where Mudafarnagar, um, this district in Uttar Pradesh, um, where there was virtually no um, communal violence in recent times uh, between Hindus and Muslims. Why was there such a huge eruption of um, communal clashes in, in September 2013? Um, and how does you know, the various uh, uh, crises which are happening there regarding um, you know, the economy, uh, how does that uh, propagate the communal forces and how does it uh, interact with the communal forces? And how do we move towards, um, the, the most importantly, countering the communal tendencies in this region and throughout India um, through a socialist and a, a very strictly anti-caste, uh, anti-patriarchy lens. Uh, so this is a, <laughs> there's some issues with the color here, but um, this was a map of India. <laughs> Black dot was Muzaffarnagar. So basically, this is in the northern Indian region, um, and Muzaffarnagar is a district where there's a very large um, population of Muslims. About 45% of the district is um, 
is Muslim, and in Uttar Pradesh overall there's about like 19% um, Muslim population. And uh, it's actually the biggest Indian state by, popu uh, by population, and uh, about the third, I think fourth biggest uh, state by area. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, and the main participants actually in this uh, riot uh, from the Hindu side were uh, basically the Jats, they're a community of people who uh, number on 82 million um, and they are, it's a very, um, not a very fixed label in the, that sense historically in India. Um, it, uh, historically the Jat community has not been associated with the Hindu religion as such. Um, around the uh, 16th century the Jats sort of migrated uh, throughout uh, northern India in the Manjari Plains and um, prior to this they really had um, uh, not Know, uh, taken up agriculture as a full-time occupation, um, and they really had no, um, this is important, that they had no exposure to or identification with the Hindu religion in that sense. Um, and I mean, I think that this is, uh, uh, this recent identification with Hinduism uh, as a job community has been brought about largely through a systematic attempt by the religious right, Hindu religious right, um, to influence the uh, just through this crisis, through this economic crisis, right? So that you see an in, uh, increasing number of farmer suicides in this region due to crop failure. There's a large dependence on sugarcane, which is a crop uh, that, uh, again, is is, um, is dependent on the fluctuations of the global market and uh, agrarian crisis, which has led to high unemployment among uh, Jat youth. And um, uh, basically, in, in this area, there's also a large uh, uh, population of, as I said, Muslims and also Dalits. Um, are increasingly asserting their right to um, public education, to uh, the job market. So this has um, sort of instilled a fear, well, actually, this was a fear um, amongst the job community that uh, we're not um, able to uh, assert ourselves economically, but um, this, this economic crisis has been used to sort of uh, divide the Jats uh, and, the, and the Muslims and um, instill this fear amongst them that Muslims are uh, taking Opportunities and, and jobs away from the job community. Um, I think it's important to sort of look. Uh, I mean, I won't go too in depth into this, but there's a long history of uh, Hindu Muslim unity in this area, which dates back, I think, even uh, previous to the Sikh Mutiny, uh, 1857. And um, even in recent times, there's been uh, displays of very, uh, you know, sort of commendable um, uh, acts of unity, such as during the emergency. Um, in the 70s, there was a attempt by the actually lower class, working class of Hindus and Muslims to uh, fight against forced sterilizations in Muzaffarnagar district. And there was a, a large uh, firing, police firing on a, uh, a Muslim uh, Basti, a, a Muslim community there. Um, it is also a crucial, I mean, Jats uh, have not historically been um, <laughs> uh, sort of give them uh, this uh, romantic notion that they're, they're free of any uh, uh, communal violence or any um, uh, discrimination towards uh, you know, other communities because uh, there is a long-standing uh, tradition in this area of the so-called Khab Panchayat, uh, which is a institution created by Jats, uh, which has been used to um, legitimize uh, rape of uh, women. Um, it's also been used to sort of um, uh, push the Dalits uh, to the side and also um, uh, legitimize acts of, of violence towards both Dalits and mostly lower caste um, and lower class women, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, as I said before, the, there's a large population of Muslims and Hindus of um, And the beginning of this current um, communal clash starts with locals, as I said, the swords were distributed um, and uh, in 2012, March 2012, the RSS uh, praised Modi, um, so there was an attempt to sort of mobilize people with Modi and uh, criticize the local um, BJP party for, uh, uh, for a lack of inspirational leadership in Uttar Pradesh. Um, and uh, there was a couple incidents where uh, Hindu girls had uh, married Muslim boys, and uh, these were used to sort of again um, fuel the flames of uh, communism. Uh, the local people claimed that. Uh, I actually coerced the Hindu girl into marriage, um, and there was a, there were reports of uh, local uh, 
Sang Parivar, which is also another faction um, of the BJP, they uh, were training local Jat boys to instigate these uh, riots and um, uh, basically go around uh, Muzaffarnagar and um, uh, wearing you know, skull caps, uh, pretending to be Muslims, and uh, teasing Hindu women, um, and uh, uh, vice versa for the Muslim women. Um, so this was uh, also Another thing that happened was uh, fake videos were circulated um, of basically uh, Hindus being killed by um, members of Taliban, and um, this was you know, sort of depicted to be videos that were shot locally, but they were obviously videos that were fake, and um, and this sort of led to so this low intensity violence, and then um, <clears throat> which was sort of was sort of culminated in um, <clears throat> various uh, efforts in 2000, uh, early 2000. Um, where these sort of larger, large-scale mobilizations happen um, in public spaces, and uh, uh, there was one particular event where uh, several BJP MLAs were there, um, uh, uh, members of the Legislative Assembly, including um, Umar Singh, Sushrana, um, uh, Umesh Malik. So these are all uh, very well-known local faces, and uh, this is also the time when Amit Shah. Abhishek talked about, um, held a meeting in Lucknow, and he was basically hired, well not hired, but he was asked as a personal favor to Modi to um, uh, you know, fund this, <coughs> basically organize this uh, party work, BJP party work in the Western UP, and uh, manufacture this um, uh, riot. And uh, this is a quote from uh, Misha on the uh, third phase uh, prior to the election. So the elections in Uttar Pradesh, especially in Western Uttar Pradesh, is an election for honor, for seeking revenge for the insult, and for teaching a lesson to those who committed the injustice. Um, and uh, this is obviously referring to the incident of Eve teasing. Um, and in the same rally, there was a, uh, you know, a, uh, basically the same rally opened with a um, call to Bharat Mataji, which is um, you know, a way to project India as a so-called mother. And um, then he sort of launched into uh, a speech, Amit Shah launched into a speech on, um, <coughs> in which he saluted the mothers of Muzaffarnagar, who gave birth to the sons who killed the perpetrators of these uh, Eve, you know, Eve teasing, of Eve teasing, and um, basically saying that you know every brother should protect their sister in this way, and um, uh, you know this sort of implies that a mother's ultimate responsibility is to uh, not only give birth. <laughs> And also, more importantly, to inculcate um, anti-Muslim sentiments in their sons. Um, so this was, um, you know, this is very sort of indicative of this broader trend um, of using women, women's bodies as instruments uh, in uh, uh, fascist violence. And uh, this is a quote from Hasina Khan, who has worked um, uh, in depth on this issue, uh, which I think kind of sums it up. Uh, even though Gujarat 2002 stands out for the unprecedented explosion of sexual violence that was unleashed on minority women and despite the public outrage and the many pledges of preventing repetitions for a bank scenario, the violence in was offered as a warning that the strategy <coughs> that did in Gujarat uh, in the 2002 programs is still a central element in the right-wing political arsenal, rooted as it is in the age-old perception of women, whether Hindu or Muslim, as the property of the community and as repositories of community honor. And so this has been sort of a common feature of throughout uh, right-wing human fundamentalism, um, as uh, Siddharth talked about uh, Savarkar, who uh, you know, he was very, he's a big advocate of um, uh, using uh, this human identity to uh, basically, uh, you know, portray uh, Muslims as enemies and uh, reduce the, you know, uh, actually the portraying of Muslims of, as enemies and also um, you know, using this idea to um, uh, basically uh, you know, advocate for retribution um, on the Muslim women. And uh, this idea that uh, Muslims are trying to uh, steal the women or um, uh, it's, it's a very old idea actually which has been used by the so I don't actually don't want to go too in depth into this because of the production on time. Um, but uh, there's a lot of material in this which I'm happy to share. Um, and basically this this is uh, led to a, a, a windfall gain for the BJP uh, party in the Hindu Forces in Uttar Pradesh, uh, a place where.
where, as I said, a large population of Muslim, 19% Muslim, uh, wants, uh, didn't even uh, have one uh, Muslim um, member of parliament elected to Lok Sabha, which is a, a big thing in this area. It's unprecedented. Uh, and um, the BJP and its allies won 73 of the state's 80, 80 seats, um, which is incredibly dangerous. Struggles and 